We are waiting. We are waiting for our resource persons to join. Today we are going to have two special lectures in two plenary sessions. Our resource persons today are Professor H. N. Mishra, a renowned geographer from Allahabad University, and Dr. Papia Raj from IIT Patna. Any moment the resource persons We are just taking some time. There is request. Uh, I can see some of the participants who have joined with some code number like 4B, 3B, E5, 1A. So I request those participants to rejoin. You may leave the meeting. Aap thodi der ke liye meeting se bahar jai aur fir se apne sahi naam ke saath join kare. So there is a request. There are some participants who have joined with some kind of code number that might have come automatically in your laptop or smartphones, which you are using. So kindly you leave the meeting. Admin ke naam se bhi koi join kiye hain. Aap se anurodh hai, aap ek bar meeting ke bahar jaayin aur fir se apne सही नाम के साथ ज्वाइन करें हमारे कीनोट स्पीकर थोड़ी देर में ज्वाइन करने वाले हैं Hello, sir.
Hello, sir. Good morning, sir. Professor Etienne Mishra has joined our meeting from the organizing committee of the national webinar. I extend a warm welcome, sir. That's sir, can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello, Dev Jenny. Yes, sir. Hello, Dev Jenny. Yes, sir. I can hear you. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. You are audible. So, uh, uh, you will tell me when I have to speak, okay? Okay, sir. We'll invite you. Uh, uh, Professor R.B. Singh has also come? He will no, sir. Tomorrow. Probably uh, he will not join today. He uh, will be delivering valedictory lecture tomorrow. Achha, I see. Who is, who is the chief guest today? Uh, we, there is no chief guest for webinar, sir. Uh, you are the keynote speaker. So we will have a very short opening session. And after that, in the first plenary session, we invite you to deliver the keynote address. Okay. Madam Rasmi is there or not? Yes, sister is there. Okay. And no, who are the no, other no, colleagues? And who is Mishra? Mishra. Minakshi, yes. Sir. sir. Good morning, sir. sir. Minakshi Mishra. Okay. Good morning. She is the one who is, uh, I think, uh, comparing, right? Sir, I am moderator for today's session. Yes, sir. Uh, are you Minakshi Mishra? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so I shall be looking forward to, and uh, as soon as my turn comes, please let me know, okay? Sure, sure sir. Uh. Sure. Yes, sir. We'll have a short opening session and just after that, your Brother, turn will come. You, you take your time. You take your time. No, we are starting. Uh, until then, I will be mute, okay? You mute, but keep your mute on. Okay. So all the panelists are requested to keep your microphone muted. Kindly, you can... Uh, put your video on if you have a good bandwidth you can keep your video on but uh, keep your microphone muted A very good morning and a warm welcome to Dr. Sister M. Rashmi A.C., Principal Patna Women's College Autonomous, our virtual guests and invited speakers 
Professor H.N. Mishra, our keynote speaker today, and all of you on board with us at the opening session of the national webinar on research methodology and application of GIS tools in geography. Organized by the Department of Geography, Patna Women's College Autonomous, in collaboration with the Department of Geography, Sophia Girls College Autonomous, Ajmer, Rajasthan. At the onset of this very special web event, let us invoke the blessings of the Almighty God. I request Sister Anna A.C., Assistant Professor Geography, Patna Women's College, to lead us in a world of prayer. God, our loving Father, source of all origin and end, you usher us into another day, untouched and freshly new. This is the day that you have made. We rejoice and are glad in it. With gratitude, we thank you for preserving our lives for one more day. But Lord, we are well aware we can't make it on our own. So take our hands and lead the way. O oh Master and Holy God, who are beyond our understanding, at your word, light came forth out of darkness. In your mercy, you filled us with your goodness. You are the eternal wisdom our source of life and light. Let our faith and confidence in you grow day by day. With hearts full of gratitude, we now offer you our morning homage and adoration as we listen to the devotional bhajan, for you alone are our Lord and God. Understanding and support. May your goodness and blessings be on our resource persons in a special way as they share their valuable knowledge. May your gracious presence, wisdom, and knowledge be with all the participants. May we be living witnesses of your genuine love through the implementation of the knowledge acquired through this two-day national webinar. May we continue to experience your goodness and presence in our daily lives. 
We ask this in your holy name. Amen. A very good morning to one and all. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Sister Anna. We at Patna Women's College always strive for excellence with our respected principal, Dr. Sister M. Rashmi AC, at the helm of the activities. Under Sister's able leadership, innovative insights, and motivating inspiration, Patna Women's College aspires to reach new heights of success. May I now request our respected principal to deliver her opening address. Thank you, Amrita. A very good morning to all of you and a warm welcome to this two-day webinar on research methodology and application of GIS tools in geography, organized by the Department of Geography, Patna Women's College, in collaboration with Sophia College, Ajmer, Rajasthan. A special thanks to Dr. Sister Pearl, Principal, and the Department of Geography, Sophia College, for collaborating with us to conduct this webinar. Our collaboration experience and the interest shown by you in general is praiseworthy and of course enriching. I warmly welcome our esteemed resource persons, distinguished guests, delegates from various states and colleges across the country. It is great to see all of you here at this platform, coming together in distance on and off during this time of crisis is required to keep us connected, to share our experiences and knowledge, and to enhance our knowledge and to upgrade our academic career. As all of us know, the development of GIS has opened a number of opportunities for researchers and of course, for teaching as well, across a wide variety of academic disciplines. Data collection and compilation has become easier with the introduction of GIS tools, which I did not even hear of while doing my research in those days. Now it has become a tool without which data compilation and analysis seem impossible to social scientists in particular, due to its simple and easy accessibility and usefulness. It would have been very tedious to tabulate data manually. GIS is a great tool for researching, learning, and teaching in social sciences. It can help to create a better analysis of studied interactions and phenomena. GIS can also help a researcher cross disciplinary boundaries when working on an interdisciplinary project. Research in geography can be better explored with GIS when spatial data is part of the study. Analyzing population distribution, land use, environmental degradation, along with how any of these variables interact with each other are some of the examples where a geographer can use this tool effectively. Besides the benefits of better analysis, GIS will allow for better public dissemination of the results. It can create visual representations of data, which will help to clear the problem of many researchers who want their information to be made available to the public, especially when it is made available online, the information can reach a wider audience. During this two day webinar, you are going to learn a lot more as we explore possibilities and use of different research tools in our ongoing research activities, we will definitely realize that GIS is the need of the hour for easy compilation and application of data. I take this opportunity to thank all our eminent resource persons for consenting to share your knowledge and expertise with us. Thanks to all the participants for joining us today. Thanks to the Department of Geography, Sophia College, Ajmer, 
for your collaboration and support in conducting this very useful webinar. Thanks to Dr. Dabjani Sarkar Ghosh, Head Department Geography, Padna Women's College, and all the teachers of the department for your efforts, enthusiasm, and commitment in organizing this webinar. Good luck and good wishes to all of you for a great learning experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, sister, for your words of inspiration and encouragement. Quality is not an act, it is a habit. It is always the result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution. The combination of these results into what we call the quality research. The contemporary geographical research bases itself on the perfect blend of conceptual profoundness and the effective and intelligent application of modern scientific tools. It becomes all the more relevant during the present circumstances when the entire world of academia is exploring and adopting the modern techniques of research. This special web event is being hosted to offer an effective virtual platform to the faculty members, researchers, and students of geography to gain and enhance knowledge and ideas about a very relevant and time referent theme. May I now call upon Dr. Devjani Sarkar Ghosh, Head Department of Geography, Patna Women's College, and the convener of the national webinar to introduce the focal theme in her address. Good morning. Good morning and a warm welcome in the two-day national webinar on application of GIS tools and research methodology in geography. Research is composed of two words, re and search, which means search again. Research provides an analytical framework for subject matter of investigation. It is treated as an advancement of knowledge acquired through scientific methods. Geography is a unique subject where both physical features of the Earth's surface and human activities therein are studied. Research in physical geography is, uh, involves generally in-depth analysis of the features or changes in nature due to any natural process or disaster. Research in the field of social or population geography might study the changes in the society due to pandemic like COVID-19 or economic and social activities or events. Geographers are generally interested to find interrelationship between physical and cultural aspects. Geography research should not be treated as a piece of compilation of work done by others. While doing literature survey in geography, researchers should not only track down all the relevant information, but also study the ideas contained therein and produce the argument which leads to the exposition of the research problem. In order to do that, geographers must look at the textbook from different perspectives to reveal a multi-dimensional view of the work. Geographers are expected to find new facts with the help of modern techniques available. They should gather knowledge both from secondary and primary data. With the advancement of internet, GPS, remote sensing, satellite imagery, Google Forms, collection of data has become easier along with the physical verification. This large amount of data should be statistically treated to arrive at a particular solution. Researches in social science is complementary to research in physical science and help us to understand the problem and find a possible solution. Importance of GIS in geographical research. Geographical information system is a computer system for capturing, storing, 
taking and displaying data to the earth surface by relating seemingly unrelated data gis can help individual or organization to better understand spatial pattern and relationship by preparing perfect maps and various diagrams using different gis software this tools can definitely help geographers to study physical and social geography to present and explain them in a better way and solve complex problems around the world importance of research in geography with multiple sources to collect data and innumerable ways to present them the research work in the field of geography has experienced a paradigm shift of knowledge use of gis technology help us to understand and deal with a large amount of man and environmental related data and that can be presented properly in front of administrators planners and ordinary citizen modern geographers can play a crucial role in planning for river bank environment or might be settlement of the migrated population in any parts of the world publication for publication of the research work researchers should abide by the ethics of research references should be proper to avoid any form of plagiarism work should be original and thought provoking it might consider nature or society as a laboratory where continuous changes are taking place the work should be relevant and help in the enhancement of knowledge the current two days national webinar with expert resource person are expected to understand methodology of research systematically and assimilate upcoming research that would encourage pg students to enroll for phd program phd students to complete their work or apply for the post doctorate fellowship and faculty members to do independent study in any organization or apply for the research projects relevant to the society with paradigm shift of higher education geographers should choose research topics re relevant to the current world and they must undertake the research project which will be useful using latest gis technologies they should present their data properly and such research will improve their cv and make them employable in current knowledge based society thank you Thank you, Dr. Devjani, for an illustrative explanation of the various aspects of geographical research and related methods and contemporary tools. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the opening session of the national webinar. Once again, thanks to all of you. For joining, joining us, us virtually. Without wasting much time, let us move towards the plenary sessions of the national webinar. We have with us today a very accomplished and renowned geographer of present time, Professor H. N. Mishra, on board, who will be delivering the keynote address. in the first plenary session i now call upon ms manakshi mishra assistant professor department of geography patna women's college physics chemistry and geology and also parent to history and economics it is said that without the clear grounding in the known current hello hello yes, hello sir. yes sir we can hear you yes sir we can hear you hello hello sir in between you are muted i am little disconnected yeah that's why now we can hear you 
I think uh, your figure also is not something you your bandwidth maybe. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, we can hear you. Yes, now. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. sir. We can hear you. In between, you are getting disconnected. Otherwise. Um, your connectivity problem, sir. You have some connectivity. Phone problem. Again, uh -huh. Connectivity ka problem. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, we can yes. hear. Hello. We can Hello. hear you, sir. But nobody is listening. There's we can no hear you. Is there anybody listening me? Yes. yes, sir. Yes, we all are listening to you. Please uh, ring up and tell uh, Amrita, Tabjani, uh, somebody. Tell him we can hear him. Yes, yes. Make a phone. I think something is, uh, he is not hearing our voice. Hello? Sir, hello. We can hear you. Yes, sir, you are on Yes, sir, you are audible. Hello. Yes, uh, yeah, there is no response, so I thought I don't know what is happening. We have been responding to you. You were not hearing us. Should I, I continue? Please do. Yes, I think she is muted everywhere. Oh, okay. So. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, one, uh, once again, I would like to reiterate by saying that geography is the queen of sciences, parent to physics, chemistry, and geology, and also parent to history and economics. Without without the if we get call back to Kairai. Hello? Hey, Bhaiya. Munna? Hello? Hey, Munna? Amrita, make a call to sir. We can hear you. Yes, it is all. Yes, sister, uh, we are uh, calling him. We are calling him. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, without the clear grounding in the known characteristics of the earth, the physical sciences are merely game playing and social sciences only ideology. The point that I wanted to project across to you is this time. Most of the events that have been taking place today are at the threshold of natural environment, natural ecosystem, and also the human activities. And therefore, geography is virtually one of the most relevant disciplines in the contemporary context. The important areas where geography and geographers have been focusing are varied and manifold. And over a period of time, ever since geography was born, it has undergone several paradigmic shifts. For example, before the World War II, the paradigms which operated to guide the discipline were determinism, possibilism, and stop and go determinism, so on and so forth, even including the regionalism and culturalism. But after the Second World War, the paradigm shift has been more pronounced. For example, now geography focuses more on quantitative techniques, on behavioralism, on structuralism, on post-structuralism, on uh, post-modernism, 
on feminism and so on. The point I am trying to uh, make is this, that geography has gone a sea change over a period of time. And accordingly, the fields for the research of geography have also changed tremendously. Friends, some of the areas which need geographers special attention are, for example, the human settlement system, particularly the population segment, because it is said that man is the measure of everything and population is the point of reference from which all other, other elements derive significance and meaning and it is the population which furnishes the focus. We are obviously, as you all know, number two in the whole world in terms of the total population. And the massive wave of urbanization has been significantly influencing the total spatial character of the country. A very long list of the urban centers, 53 metropolis, and about 8,000 small and intermediate towns have emerged. So most of the population is now trying to go to the uh, urban areas where the popular settlements and squatter settlements are surging in a very big way. Nearly 22% of the total population lives in the, uh, lives in the urban uh, slums and squatter settlements. That is a great challenge. Likewise, there is a great challenge as far as the growth of population in the rural areas is concerned. So this is one thing that is really a focus of research. And the other thing which is equally very important is the uh, economic aspect. Friends, this is the uh, most controversial area and uh, the entire economy is basically divided into two segments, the formal sector and the informal sector. The formal sector has a very a little role to play in terms of the employment, whereas the informal sector is much more significant because it absorbs a very large number of people. In fact, the recent migration and the problems associated with it, which have uh, cropped up after the lockdown, is basically because of the uh, because of the people who have been engaged in the informal sector of the economy. Fortunately or unfortunately, this plays a very dominant role and the uh, industrial segment is only located at few, at few select locations. So there is a tremendous degree of disparity and this uh, uh, what you call Bajar economy of the Indian context is to be examined in great detail. Likewise, the other segment which has been playing a very significant role is a social uh, aspect. Our society over a period of time has been divided into several castes, religions, and variety of divisions have taken place. Particularly, the divisions have become much more pronounced, especially because of the invasions that have taken place, and particularly because of the colonialism, which survived for a very long period of time. This colonialism promoted the caste. A lot of people try to blame Manushas, which was what you call, uh, which was written by Manu. Manu never has ever in his 12 chapters ever tried to emphasize the, uh, the, the caste system. He has simply tried to emphasize the four important qualities of the total population. And therefore, there is a lot of misgiving, misgiving about the Manu Shastra and it is the role of the geographers to figure out as to over a period of time how 
this caste segment, the the uh, religion, and variety of other uh, what you call divisions have fragmented the Indian fabric, which was basically and is unity in diversity. This is yet another challenging area. The uh, third challenging area is basically the regional inequality. A tremendous degree of spatial inequality exists on the surface of the area, the surface of the earth. Especially in the Indian context, we figure out that there, there are some areas which are reasonably rich. There are some areas which are moderately uh, poor and there are some areas which are very poor. And if you uh, look over the map which displays the multi-dimensional poverty index, we find that the state is states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal, so on and so forth, they have been suffering and ailing because of the poverty, not only poverty, also because of the spatial inequality. See, geography deals with the place, space, and also the regions, the regional association, the regional differentiation, and also the regional relationship. These are all part and parcel of the analysis of the regional inequality. So there's a need for geographers to give full attention to the kind of the spatial inequality that has been prevailing in the Indian uh, context. Friends, there are now a new region is emerging, which is being carved out by information technology. So information technology has become so much important that special areas are being carved out in the Indian landscape. The other area, which is equally of very important, uh, very important for the analysis by the geographers, is can be said to be the natural system where the uh, degradation of land, the extreme events, for example, climate change, weather aberration, and uh, uh, degradation of the forest and water crisis have their pronounced effect in certain areas. Friends, we have a very typical classification of the forest. Forest is the one which tries to regulate the hydrological cycle. But over a period of time, we have seen that there has been a very large scale cutting of the trees and plants and the, and the forest have almost disappeared. And therefore, the hydrological cycle has also been disturbed. This is a, a crisis. Which needed to which needed to be noted with great concern, friends. There are so many extreme events. For example, disasters. Of course, there are disaster risk reduction methodologies available. Nevertheless, geographers have to focus their due attention. For example, many things have been put in a manner style that local. For example, forest. Earlier, the forest they divided like not like equatorial mediterranean west european so on and so forth the division of the forest was sri ban khand ban and then tapo ban and then uh Kaj ban means sri bans which are the decorative areas around the settlements and the khand bans are the one where from people used to take the uh, timber and wood for their use and tapoban is the one where people will use it for their tapasya and there are some areas which are completely inaccessible and those, those areas have been completely deprived of from the human accessibility but we have been so the point that i am trying to make is this that we have to promote the indigenous theories and models, indigenous technique by which to analyze the, uh, the regional inequality, 
the natural ecosystem, the uh, forest ecology, the uh, social system, and likewise uh, the human settlement systems and distribution of population in rural and urban areas. Hello, John has started screen sharing. Okay, friends, this by having said that, what I am trying to say is this that the epistemology, the ontology, and the methodology of geography has changed tremendously over a period of time. Friends, the trajectory of knowledge is running very fast. And we are all trying to know as to what is the best way for human survival and development. Often there is a talk about sustainable development. I will go into the detail about the concept of sustainable development later. Nevertheless, at this point of time, I would like to simply say that the trajectory of knowledge is running very fast. There is an explosion of information and we have to select as to which information is correct. That is a great challenge before all of us. See, things uh, uh, are changing so fast. For example, the, there has been traditional knowledge which we have inherited over a period of time from our forefathers, from the uh, traditions of the communities, societies, so on and so forth. So this is called traditional knowledge, which, have been, which has been very operated, particularly in the Eastern segment, for example, in Northeast, maybe Arunachal Pradesh, Manipur, and uh, Tripura. In all these areas, traditional knowledge has been uh, very, important source of information. The other knowledge is the authoritative knowledge. This is a knowledge which is imposed by some authorities without verifying the, uh, the uh, are having the real check of it. So authorities say that this is the way the things are to be operated and we start believing it. There is a uh, third knowledge, which comes from intuitive judgment, we, we have our own experience and on the basis of this, this is a very dangerous and this is the way we try to generalize things. However, there is a yet another kind of knowledge which is known as scientific knowledge. And this scientific knowledge is the knowledge which is based on the empirical evidence, which is based on the methodical investigation and which has the character of revaluation and reapplication. So empirical evidence is important so that we are able to uh, substantiate the scientific research and likewise it is very important that we should have some methodology we should test we should smell we should have some data by which we should be able to prove that yes the knowledge that we are trying to gather is correct and the the next is what you call uh, replicability the knowledge which is scientific must also be at the same time replicable. Replicable means it can be repeated. If any knowledge in other circumstances cannot be replicated, which means there is some fallacy and that is not the scientific knowledge. Friends, it is here that the research starts. In order to uh, verify that the knowledge is not traditional, that the knowledge is not intuitive, that the knowledge is not authoritative, that the knowledge that we have is basically based on scientific investigation requires research. Re Let me submit that 
those who do research, they are the most fortunate people on earth. Because in Gita, Lord Krishna says, Tat Vidhi Pranipatena Pariprasnena Sevaya Updechan Kite Gyanam Gyanina Tattu Darishinam Nai Gyanena Sadesam Pavitram Mehivirdhate There is nothing more sacrosanct and more pious than knowledge. And therefore, those who are in the journey of research, they are the most fortunate people on the surface of the earth. Friends, because they are searching knowledge. There is a very subtle difference in between knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom comes out of veneration and that is a tremendous degree of understanding. Whereas, whereas knowledge is the bunch of information which has been verified by scientific uh, elements, for example, methodical investigation, for example, reapplicability method, for example, empirical evidences. So, in order that the knowledge, the information that we have collected is knowledgeable, has knowledge and comes into the realm of knowledge, we have to do research. Friends, research is a journey from discovered to undiscovered. This is a journey virtually from known to unknown because we try to explore those areas, those segments, those uh, what you call uh, things which are not known so far. And this journey from known to unknown, this journey from discovered to undiscovered is very painful, full of misery. And whenever, when, when the misery, the suffering, the pain become, is, is very heightened, which means you are almost trying to achieve the goal and objectives of the research. Because which means if you surpass all hurdles during the course of your journey from known to unknown, and if you are able to achieve the goal during the course of your suffering and misery through the path that you have traveled, that means you have achieved the goal. Ladies and gentlemen, there are four types of goals of the research. One goal, I would say, is known as explanatory goal. Sorry, uh, exploratory goal. You do explore things. Take a small case, some area, some photographs, and based on your are on your own observation, you try to describe whatever you try to experience out of it by seeing a region, by seeing a community, by seeing a group of people, by being in the society, by on the basis of your observation and experiences, whatever you try to gather that is known as exploratory research, particularly this is done in order to collect the new knowledge of those areas which are comparatively inaccessible and nothing has been done so far. This is basically a qualitative type of research. The second goal that is set by the researcher is Descriptive. Whatever you see, whatever you observe, you try to describe. Friends, this description is maybe quantitative. A lot of people try to classify research into qualitative 
and quantity. I say I think that is completely wrong. There is nothing like exclusively quantitative, quantitative, high qualitative research. It a research could be both qualitative as well as quantitative. And most of the time, the qualitative research is also in order to verify certain facts becomes the quantitative. So both the techniques are used together. Nevertheless, please remember that exploratory, exploratory research is always qualitative type, whereas descriptive research is based on quantification, meaning thereby you try to collect the data. So the first one, exploratory research is basically based on observation and also the feeling, the emotions, the experiences that you share, that you share. Whereas the descriptive research is basically quantitative and data is used in order to support the facts and figures. The third research is basically explanatory research. You try to explain some causal and not try to give the causal correlations for certain things. And in the process, you become very analytical. Friends, here I would like to submit that there are three types of models which are used in geography. One is the iconic model. The other is analog model. And the third is the symbolic model. The third is the symbolic model. The iconic model, I would say, is basically exploratory. Whereas the analog model is basically the uh, model which is uh, based on mapping, for example, if you want to show the distribution of population on the surface of the earth, you do not put the man on the map. What you do, you try to convert it into analog. Say you use the maybe isoplate or maybe dot or maybe some symbols in order to show the location of the industry or in order to show the distribution of population, or in order to show the density distribution of population. So this is called analog model. I think uh, you are clear what is iconic. Iconic model is, is the uh, form. It has a certain form. For example, some statue, a statue of maybe uh, Patel, a statue of maybe Pandit Jawala Nehru, Jay Prakash Narayan, that is the what you call analog model, an iconic model. But the analog model, when you try to display the distribution of population by some symbols, such as darts, isoplate, and also by choroplate, then that is not known as analog model. The third model is known as symbolic model wherein you try to use the equation. For example, y is equal to a plus bx, where a is constant and b becomes the variant keeps on changing. So it could be y is equal to a plus bx1 plus bx2 and like like bx n. So depending upon whether it is a a uh, simple analysis or, my, or multivariate analysis, it depends. I have just by the best led that there are three types of models, much talk, much, much more is talked and discussed about the models, but a lot of people don't know how to model because the whole world is so big and it is very difficult to display the world on the map. And therefore, models are so very important. Models are virtually the representation of the reality on the map and therefore they have been clubbed into three categories, iconic, analog and symbolic. 
So, uh, when you are explanatory, you use the uh, uh, the symbolic model or mathematical model or equations in order to explain the certain things because anything, everything cannot be explained by one simple variable. For example, there can be one dependent variable. There can regional inequality is the independent variable, but this is influenced by a number of factors and those number of factors we take them as v1 v2 v3 known as variables which keep on changing and they impinge upon this dependent variable so v1 v2 v3 bx v1 these are the uh, what you call independent variable and x that is the inequality is the dependent variable so when you have one dependent variable and several independent variables and try to explain the things then that is called explanatory research then there is a, a fourth goal of the researcher that is evaluation friends when you uh, there are some projects effect for example of the dams which have been uh, made uh, built the effects of the road the effects of the uh, railways or any other changes which have been taking place in a particular area and you try to examine the impact by evaluating the utility of this project whether it is success or failure and if it is a success to what extent if it is a failure what are the remedial measures then that is called evaluatory research Thus, thus the point that i have made that the research goals are four types one is explanatory the other is descriptive and the third is explanatory and the fourth is evaluation these are the four types of researches now friends i would like to uh, go into some other domain and that is uh, how the research design is uh, prepared so the first and foremost thing is to describe the objectives review the literature and after having reviewed the literature you try to formulate the hypothesis after having formulated the hypothesis you try to collect the data and after having collected the data you try to analyze the data and after having analyzed the data you try to report the uh, report the research friends here it is very important to mention that research method and methodology research method contains for example the field work that you do the data that you collect the sampling that you do and the hypothesis that you test these are research methods whereas research methodology is much more comprehensive and includes anything everything any uh, process you undergo in the uh, during the course of research is known as research methodology for example research methodology therefore is the combination of methods and techniques both methods and techniques together for example you have you are doing some library consultation how are you consulting how are you preparing the note that is the technique and for example you are doing the field work are you doing the questionnaire the schedule the interview uh, the telephone directory these are the field work that you do is the method and the 
and the technique that you follow to collect the data that is called technique and therefore research methodology is a combination of methods and techniques together so research methodology is much more comprehensive a term as compared to that of research methods friends here i did mention about the hypothesis 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 means a small field see when child is born he immediately feels the air the atmospheric sensation so he has some sensory perception and after some time that sensory perception is converted into the conception so perception leads to conception conception leads to hypothesis testing and hypothesis hypothesis formulation hypothesis testing and hypothesis testing becomes the grand generalization which is known as the theory so there are four stages one is the perception second is the conception third is the hypothesization and the next is the grand generalization although i would like to put a note here note of caution here now there is too much emphasis on the uh, not on the grand generalizations but on uh, what you call uh, local specializations because it has been felt very seriously that globalization liberalization and privatization have made the world borderless but this is not so friends in fact the speciality does remain in spite of the fact that it has penetrated globalization liberalization and private and uh, privatization have penetrated very deep into the uh, economic system in all walks of life nevertheless there is no denying the fact that the speciality what you call based on the values traditions customs and cultures they do reflect and therefore there is a place there is a uh, there is a place there is area there is a space there are regions and there are big regions so the point that i am trying to make is this that because of the fact that there is a tremendous degree of speciality that does exist on the surface of the earth it is the job of the geographer to find out what are those elements or variables which are responsible for this speciality and in order that to understand the nature of this speciality we have to think at the global level think globally act locally so most of the theories that you notice today for example crystal central phase theory are one to lens agriculture location model ours may be concentric ring theory in the uh, in the development of urban area or multiple nuclei theory or who you call you call what you call the sector theory all these theories which were prepared in the western context may not necessarily be relevant in the indian context over a period of time friends it is unfortunate They, that we have been trying to over emphasize the models and theories which we have developed and built into the western uh, landscape fortunately or unfortunately during the last 100 years ever since we have been specializing and teaching geography we have tried to project across our students those models and theories which have been more relevant in the western context we never realized that the notion the uh, the the landscape of india is altogether that is called bharat is so very different and therefore the western models and theories may not necessarily be relevant in the indian context 
it is the job of the researcher particularly the geographers because geographers are the one who are supposed to be the most responsible people on the surface of the earth to bring out the facts and figures of different specializations prevailing on the surface of the earth and they are the people who are basically responsible for promoting the cause of sustainable development which happens the basic aim and objective of the indian philosophy i will deal with this later let me summarize here that hypothesis building is very very relevant and important there are friends two types of hypothesis one hypothesis is known as null hypothesis what is a null hypothesis when we have two things and say there is no difference between the two this is a null hypothesis and when we say that there is a difference in x and y variables are in this place or in that place are in this area and that area are in the values and systems of this uh, place and that place so when we say there are differences this is called alternative hypothesis so hypothesis broadly may be summarized as hypothesis null hypothesis as i said that it has the it presumes that there is no difference between two three four five segments whatever we are the objects being dealt when there is no difference then that is called what you call null hypothesis but when we realize that no the difference differences do exist and we hypothesize there is a difference then it is called the alternative hypothesis friends there are different ways of testing this hypothesis although much though i wish i could demonstrate to you on the uh, blackboard through uh, by chart and uh, or by some other methods maybe to demonstrate as to how what are the techniques by which the hypothesis is being tested but there are some standard uh, methods for example chi square test for example t test for example f test and these tests try to support and help in proving and disproving disapproving the hypothesis based on the uh, chi test based on the t test based on the f test we can easily say that whether null hypothesis is true or the alternate hypothesis is true even the alternate hypothesis has one tailed distribution and two tailed distribution this is a little more quantitative detail i have no uh, really uh, uh, the immediate uh, 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 solution to demonstrate as to how what is the two tailed and one tailed distribution nevertheless there are some small variations and without going into the detail at this point of time you should try to understand that null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis need to be tested friends data that becomes very important what is the type of data what is the nature of the data data are also of four types excuse me sir and based on the characteristics of the excuse data me, sir. you try to use the technique you Professor cannot Mishra. discriminate just using all the techniques now there Excuse is a me, Professor data Mishra. which is based on the names for example uh, the metamorphic rock sedimentary rock igneous Professor rock Mishra, can or you hear some me? other types of uh, rock systems when you say that the data which is collected on the basis of the name that is called nominal data the second data is the ordinal data when there is a ranking that kalabad university is better than other universities and we start ranking for example patna college is number 1 college 
and all other colleges in the state of Bihar are at number two, three, Professor four, Mishra, five, six. Can you hear me? When we give this kind of ranking based on the performances of the college, then this ranking uh, is based on is used to collect the ordinal data. This is ordinal data, and there is a yet another data when there is an interval or ratio data. Ratio data, for example, the uh, the relationship between degree Fahrenheit and degree Celsius. So the we we know that this is a freezing point in when we talk in terms of Celsius, this is a freezing point in terms of the Fahrenheit. And when we try to explore the possibility of having the relative kind of data in terms of Fahrenheit or degree Celsius, this is the, the ratio data or pounds and uh, what you call kilos or what you call the food pound system and uh, what you call the meter kilogram system. So the, this is a relative uh, kind of uh, measurement. And for example, uh, the data, the density per square kilometer. So uh, this is another type of data. So when I said nominal data, ordinal data, and interval data, and ratio data, we should try to understand the differences in the these four segments or four sets of data before we try to jump into the conclusion of using the techniques. Unless and until you are very discreet and try to know. I'm very sorry about it. Sorry? Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, so what I am trying, to, sir, are you able conclude. to hear me? Please, yes, sir, please conclude, sir. We I said speaker. that data is of four types, nominal data, ordinal data, interval data, and ratio data. Depending upon the nature of the data, we try to use the techniques. And accordingly, we try to test the hypothesis. Friends, uh, most of the time, geographers limit themselves only to bivariate distributions that uh, X depends upon Y. But most of the phenomena that you see on the surface of the Earth, Hello. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Sir, please conclude the session. We are we are having. Is it my voice time. is clear? Somebody should tell me, please. Yes, sir. Sir, yes, we are. Sir. No, no, no. Hello. Yes, sir. But please Dr. conclude, Shapiro, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. But please conclude. Are you able to hear me? There yes, is a sir. complaint that I I am inaudible. From Ravi Ranjan Pandey to all panelists. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Are uh, you please give me detail? Are you able to hear me? I am. Mm. Sir, we can Jana listen you. Sir, from, uh, sir participants who yes, are sir, having it, network it is, issues, no, they are not able to listen. Otherwise, you are audible. Mm -hmm. Sir, if you can hear me, Professor Misra, if you can hear me. Uh, sir, we are running out of time. Sir, can you please conclude the session? Hello. Those who are listening me, please give me the message. 
वहां कुछ हो ही नहीं रहता है मुझसे तो दिखाई मुझे समझ में सर हम आपको सुन पा रहे हैं सर आपकी आवाज हम सुन पा रहे हैं हेलो इफ यू इफ यू अलाउ आई कैन स्विच ऑफ माई कैमरा एंड कंटिन्यू स्पीकिंग सर इट्स ऑलरेडी स्विच ऑफ योर कैमरा इज ऑलरेडी स्विच ऑफ बट वी आर लिसनिंग टू यू सो Uh, so the point that i am trying to make is this that uh, the sir, sir, uh, but sir please phenomena that you see on session. the surface of our our multi variate it is not one single variable or two variables which are able to uh, explain the phenomena and therefore multi variate analysis yeah, man, has listen. also become important for example you. principal component uh, sir, factor sir. analysis and also uh, g score at a lower level these are some of the uh, techniques which are used friends it is very important here to tell to project across to you that geography has really traveled a very long distance from myth to map and from map to from map to geospatial technology in fact the Ah, so the geospatial technology, which means remote sensing, then GIS or geographic information system, or more importantly, geospatial technology plays a very pivotal, dominant role. We have paucity of time. Uh, very Seven dominant role in the paucity of time explanation of geographic phenomena friends i would like to submit that this technology is so very pragmatic and so very valuable that we were able to by using this technique uh, locate the one of the greatest terrorists of the world that is osama bin laden john agnew from the John Agnew from the University of uh, British Columbia, it, with his team, was able to locate his destination in Pakistan. Friends, therefore, the geospatial technology is very important. But at the same time, it is imperative that we should not confine this technique of using the raster and vector data, confining only to mapping and preparing the colorful, uh, colored maps. rather there is a need to uh, use this technique for monitoring monitoring and also for management unless and until we use the geospatial technology for mapping for monitoring and also for management management the technology will have no meaning the point that i am trying to make that it is really not enough this small session is not enough for me to explain all the details of the geospatial technology much though i wish that i would have projected across to you and displayed physically as to role played by the maps superimposed maps the role played by the monitoring and the role played by the management with the help of the geospatial technology but the time constraint does not permit me uh, i hope i have tried to uh, give uh, uh, give uh, a, a uh, overall picture of the research methodology which is relevant and useful productive for the researchers doing research in the field of geography and i would like to conclude by saying that i would submit my unqualified apology if there has been some snag because of and some glitches in the technology i'm very sorry about it mas do i wish that it could not happen and however i would like to express my gratitude thanks for giving me this great opportunity to uh project across to you some of my ideas pertaining to 
research methodology, its importance, especially with focus on geospatial technology and also how the different kinds of technology could be useful and productive in uh, mapping the different kinds of paradigm shifts that have taken place over a period of time with the development of geography. With this, I would like to conclude and say, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Nevertheless, if there has been some problem, I am really very sorry. The technology is always like that. And therefore, we should not be fully dependent upon technology. Therefore, exploratory research is much more important than being so very a technologist. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your enlightening address. We do look forward to listen to you again in our future events. Please accept our sincere gratitude once more. Thank you, sir. Now I request, sir, and all the participants to put on camera to capture these moments. Sir, can you please uh, put on your camera? Thank you. Welcome back, dear participants, in the second plenary session, which is also the last session of day one. We are extremely happy to have Dr. Papya Raj as our virtual resource person for this plenary session. Dr. Papya Raj is an associate professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Patna. She is a public health expert specializing in reproductive and maternal health. Dr. Raj was the recipient of Canadian Commonwealth Scholarship and completed her PhD degree from McGill University, Montreal. She was a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Population and Public Health at University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Dr. Raj has received research fundings from various national and international organizations, including ICSSR, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Grant Canada. She has also been a consultant to various international projects. In 2017, she had been the recipient of Best E-Poster Award by Indian Public Health Association. Dr. Raj serves in the editorial board for various journals, including Sage Open, Waste Management and Research, Canadian Journal of Public Health, Amiti Journal of Healthcare Management. Now I sincerely request Dr. Papya Raj to deliver her special lecture on navigating contemporary research methods. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, please unmute your mic. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. So very good afternoon uh, to Sister Rashmi, AC Principal of Patna Women's College, to uh, Dr. Devjani Sharkar Ghosh, all the faculty colleagues in the Department of Geography, as well as other departments of Patna Women's College, all the panelists, as well as the organizers of this important webinar. So uh, I think in the previous session, uh, Professor Mishra had kind of given us a very good overview about uh, you know the uh, discipline of geography how it has evolved over time so i will not actually go into uh, the nitty gritties of it but the reason why i call it navigating contemporary research method i'd like to take it from where dr mishra has elaborated the nature of geography has evolved you know earlier we were kind of concentrated into physical and human geography and then when we had human geography now we have multiple 
multiple sub branches of human geography so when the discipline is evolving it is also necessary to understand how the various research methods around the discipline are evolving and the reason i use the term navigating because i think as geographers we kind of relate ourselves well with the navigator right we are so good with the compasses and the maps so having said that i will just give a very short outline of my presentation today i'm not going to discuss specifically about each and every research method which all of us are quite accustomed to rather i have designed my presentation in a way which will allow us to choose the perfect method for our research that we are doing and at the onset let me just remind ourselves that there is no right or wrong method it is justified the choice of method is justified by various other factors and first of all i'm going to discuss about the criteria that are that allow us to choose certain research methods then according to me the whole process of research can be delineated into three to four broad stages and the first stage of research is that first we have to make a design of the study that we are going to conduct so i'm going to delve into that the second part of course of any research is data collection that will be the next part of my presentation and then i'm going to talk specifically about some of the conventional research methods about qualitative and quantitative but not going to, into very in depth of uh, each and every method because i understand we have paucity of time and each method in itself could be a uh, subject of a specific lecture then i would also like to discuss some of the contemporary methods for example mixed method which has become very common in all other disciplines including geography and digital method you know in the web in the era of internet when internet is kind of the lifeline for all of us so we need to talk specifically about digital method and having talked about all this method i'm also going to discuss about how to could do data analysis you know that is also a part of the very integral part of the research that we are doing and the most important part which we kind of take for granted and not give much attention to but i would like to talk about it as well which is dissemination of research now first i will move into the criteria for using, uh, using research method now professor mishra in his lecture has already mentioned that how we should try to actually uh, delineate a research problem so when we try to develop a research problem the first and foremost step for uh, this activity is to find out what are the gaps in in the literature just to make sure that our research is not repetitive you know whenever we think of any research idea whether we are researcher at an advanced stage of our career in the middle stage or you know we are an enthusiastic research scholar we think that whatever idea has come to our mind is the noble idea but we need to find out that has work already been done on it and if so what are the gaps no no research can be full proof you know there are always some gaps that are left out and from there the uh, a future researcher can take up so for that we need to do a good review of literature to find the gaps in the research after we have found that the second step is that we have to find out what is the aim of our research what is exactly that we are looking for or try to look for and that will guide our research objectives you know what are the basic specificities of that we want to conclude based on the research and based on our research objectives we formulate our research questions so this is basically kind of the road map so when we have the research problem developed we know our destination and when we do know our destination then we know what are the research methods that is what is the path that is to be followed to reach to the destination for example if we want to go to timbuktu we cannot go on foot so it is the first and foremost step for us to develop a research problem 
Now, having developed a research problem, we have to design our study. That is very important, you know. And when we talk about design of a study, now the study design, as I said, it depends on the nature of the research question. What is it you are looking for? What is it that you want to find out through your research? So the study design, there are generally two generic type of study design. There are various others, you know, smaller uh, kind of study designs that I will not go into very detail, but I'll give a very generic overview. And the first type of uh, study design is cross-sectional study, which is the study most commonly done by by researchers and this is the uh, what is the defining feature of the cross-sectional study is that it can compare different population groups at a single point of time for example if you want to do a study of the experience of the people who are infected with COVID-19 as COVID-19 positive, we might do a cross-sectional study. Our study population might be elderly, might be young people, might be from Bihar, might be from UP, might be from Delhi. So what we are doing is that we have different population groups whom we are actually uh, trying to analyze at a particular point of time. And as I said, this is the most uh, common uh, type of study design that is adopted by researchers uh, because you know it is more convenient because as researcher we always have the paucity of time we have paucity of funding so we cannot be you know over optimistic however we need to know the second type of study and which is also done it's not that it's never done which is the known as the longitudinal study so it is a type of research method which is used to discover relationship between variables that are not related to different background variables and involves studying the same group of individuals over an extended period of time. So unlike the cross-sectional study, which is done at a point of time in the longitudinal study, we have a study population whom we study over a period of time. For example, to uh, talk about again the COVID-19 positive um, people and the reason I'm giving example from COVID-19 is because because this is something which is so contemporary and all of us can kind of relate to that and thanks uh, and you know it is one of the reason that is why we are having a webinar and not a seminar uh, so if you want to do a longitudinal study of the co people who are uh, tested positive with COVID-19 so perhaps we take a set same set of people so for example 20 people who have tested positive we try to analyze whatever criteria variables we take in 2020 then in 2021 June we kind of conduct research on the same group of people the people doesn't change again we conduct research on the same group of people you know in 22 23 in the consecutive years and this type of study though it, it gives very good authentic result but the problem is that it is very cost effective and one major problem is that many of the participants they drop out of the study you know all the 20 people that we might be studying now perhaps a year later they might not not be willing to participate in the study. Many of them might have moved to different places. So it is very difficult to maintain the sample size. However, as I said, in health geography, we do a lot of longitudinal study. And one of the examples of this is done by Stats Canada when they do the, um, when they try to analyze the reproductive health status of women, as well as children's health till the age of five. So once we have decided on a study design, whether to do a cross-sectional study or a longitudinal study, the next process is data collection, which as Professor Mishra said, is very important, you know, what type of data do we need? So when we actually emerge into the process of data collection, data can be collected in two ways. First is a complete enumeration. That is every single variable and subjects or people are enumerated. Most of the time it is not possible because it requires a lot of resources in terms of money, time and humans. And the example is census, you know, census of India, we conduct it every 10 years because it is a complete enumeration. So it is, again, it is one of the best ways of collecting data, but it has a lot of limitations. So what do we do as researchers? We go on with sampling. 
what is sampling? It is only a proportion of the people are studied and sampling is mostly followed in social sciences because for us, unlike the physical sciences, the entire society is a laboratory, right? So it is very difficult for us to emerge in complete enumeration. Therefore, we go for sampling. Now, before I discuss sampling techniques or sampling methods, I would just like to refresh our memories on some of the useful terminologies that are often associated with sampling and that are many a times misinterpreted by us, which leads to erroneous result. So the first thing that when we talk about sampling is the population. What is a population? In sampling, population is not synonymous to people. Population is a universe of units from which samples can be selected. So we use the term unit because, as I said, not necessarily the researcher is sampling people. As geographers, when we do regional development, we could be sampling cities, we could be sampling communities, neighborhoods, regions. So population is just not people. Population is the unit that we want to study. And this is very, this is something that we have to get it very clear on our mind. And especially, you know, when uh, some of the other experts will be talking about uh, GIS and other techniques, uh, these terms are very important. Second, sample. What is the sample? Sample is a segment of the population that is selected for investigation. So we always try to choose representative sample because we want to make the sample representative of the entire population from which it has been chosen. For example, if we are talking about underdeveloped uh, uh, provinces or states in kind of India, then our sample might include Bihar and UP, the Bimaru states, uh, or which are now coined as EAG states because that will be more representative right and as I said it need, need not be just people so if that reflects the population accurately so that it is a microcosm of the population it is very well representative of the units on which we are uh, kind of conducting the research the next is sampling error, which is the error in the findings derived from research due to difference between the sample and the population from which it is selected. So if you have a large population, you have to be very uh, kind of uh, um, very uh, judiciously choose your sample size. Otherwise, you will have sampling error that will then give to uh, wrong results. Now, talking about samplings, I will not go into very detail about it, but I will just give a very, uh, you know, very broad overview about the two broad types of sampling techniques that are generally there. First is a probability sampling, which we all know that it is a sample that has been selected using random selection method so that each unit in the population has a known chance of being selected. So generally a probability sample generates a representative sample. Why? Because it reduces sampling error and also bias in sampling. The next type of sampling is non-probability sampling, which is a sample that has not been selected using a random selection method. And it implies that some units of the population are more likely to be selected than the others. And as I said, that don't be perturbed that whether you are going uh, by a probability sampling technique or a non-probability sampling technique, it depends on your research question. What does your research question want? What type of sampling is needed to answer your research questions to meet your research objectives. That is most important. Now, uh, some examples of probability sampling, you know, if you go to any statistics books, there are n number of pr probability sampling, they will kind of uh, list out, but uh, don't get confused. So I just tried to put a gist of the basic types of probability sampling that uh, are there. First, as we know, is a simple random sample, which is every, you know, we just select them on a random basis. And then we have the systematic uh, sample. Systematic is that we select the sample in a systematic way. So for example, we say that every fourth person, every, for example, if in this webinar, we want to do a systematic sample, we say every fourth participant will be chosen 
to ask a question to the panelist in the second session. So that is a systematic sample. We can also do stratified random sampling. What do we do in stratified random sampling? We said, okay, for example, in this panelist, we have research scholars, we have, you know, lecturers, we have uh, uh, faculty colleagues who are in different stages of their career. So we stratify stratify them according to their position and from each stratification we randomly select that who will be allowed to participate in the question answer session so that is a stratified random sampling the fourth probability type of probability sampling will be the multi-stage cluster sampling you know Again, what we do in the multi-stage cluster sampling, we have the sample uh, into clusters, for example, on the basis of gender, on basis of age, and we form the cluster and among them, we can uh, select them on a random basis. Now, each of this can be mixed match. And that's why in the stats book, you have n number of probability sampling. We could have systematic random sampling, such, uh, stratified systematic random sampling, multi-stage uh, systematic random cluster sampling. So, you know, as as I said, don't be confused, but these are the main types of probability sampling that we can indulge into. Now, coming to types of non-probability sampling, first and foremost, we have convenience sampling, you know, and we do a lot of non-probability sampling in social sciences because as I said, uh, you know, for us, the entire society is a laboratory. So what is convenience sampling? You choose the sample as per the convenience of the researcher. Okay. Okay. So there is nothing wrong in it because you have to find how convenient it is to reach to your sample. And again, it is guided by the research question. Then the second one is snowball sampling. You know, most of us are very accustomed to with it and it is a very frequently used type of sampling technique um, in non-probability uh, sampling that we do. So what we, uh, what we do, you know, it rolls like a snowball. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have ever witnessed either in movies or in real life life how, how you start making a snowball you just start with a small amount of snow and you keep it rolling it and it becomes a big ball and that's what happens in snowball sampling you start with few nodes few key informants or key contacts as we call them so if you have five key informants then each one of them gives you five more contacts so from five you have 25 and then from 25 you know each of them gives you say five more contacts then it kind of keeps on increasing exponentially but the problem with snowball sampling is that you should know where to stop it going Otherwise, it becomes repetitive and the type of information that the researcher gets might not be as useful as intended to be. The third type of sampling that you have is a purposive sampling. Purposive sampling means that you have a purpose for which you are actually doing the sampling. Purpose is again your research question. For example, you know, drawing from the type of work that I do, when we want to study the reproductive health or maternal health of women, so we say that our sampling, we kind of put a criteria. We say that we are going to consider in our sample women who are either pregnant or have given birth in the three years preceding the survey. So anybody who comes into this category falls into our sampling um, kind of framework. So you kind of decide the criteria, you know, for example, you want to do um, uh, kind of a research on children, on youth. So you decide the criteria, you know, you decide the age group, you decide the gender, you can decide even the place of residence. So that is how we do purposive sampling. The fourth one is scope sampling, which is not very encouraged into uh, the type of academic research. Uh, but of course, it is also uh, kind of uh, we do it at times and most of the times the polls that you see uh, in the media you know how many people are giving what opinion those kind of survey polls are based on quota sampling is it that you know um, uh, whoever is kind of uh, um, available to you you kind of ask them the question and they reply to you when you go to shopping malls you know they give out flyers and they ask you to kind of fill it out uh, giving you the illusion that you will you might get some prizes which i don't think anybody gets but anyway these are examples of quota sampling and as i said you could mix probability and non probability sampling also you could do purpose uh, purposive random sampling 
purpose of stratified random sampling, depending again on what is the need of your research question. Now, once we have decided on how to collect that data, that is whether to do a complete enumeration or sampling, you know, we cannot actually forget also the assumptions for qualitative sampling. You know, people say when we are doing qualitative research, how do we sample? Of course, you do sampling in qualitative research as well. But in qualitative research, as I tried to show in this uh, flow uh, chart, that what we take uh, for uh, what we presume is that social actors are not predictable like objects, right? You cannot choose your samples. It is not picking up the type of stones on the river bank. You are talking about real people. So that's where there's a difference between a physical geography and human geography, okay? And that's how the research methods also kind of differ. So we uh, kind of assume that social actors are not predictable like objects. So randomized events are irrelevant to social life. You're just gonna randomly select because not necessarily that everybody might have experienced the same uh, kind of experience, the, experience the similar type of events that we are trying to analyze or the phenomena that we are trying to talk about. So, and probability sampling therefore becomes very expensive and inefficient when we are trying to do a qualitative type of sampling. Therefore, non-probability sampling is the best approach. So, as I said, it is actually dependent on the need of your research question, how, what type of sampling techniques you are going to choose. Now, having said that, let me come to research design. Now, when we talk of research design, it depends on sources of data. And this research design is again kind of, you know, uh, it is the research methods we are going to use. And research method is kind of a toolbox. It has all the tools. You have to pick out which tool you need to use. So you have to know what you are going to do. If you think of doing gardening, you cannot pick up a hammer. Similarly, you know, if you want Want to uh, kind of put a nail on the wall, you cannot uh, pick up a screwdriver. So you have to de depend on what type of activity and here the activity is what research question you're going to answer. You have to judiciously choose your tool accordingly. So this research design depends on the sources of data that we are going to use. There are two sources of data. First is the primary data, which is collected by the researcher. And the second is the secondary data, which is using an already existing data source. Again here, let me remind you that don't think that if you're using a secondary data source, your uh, research is less relevant to people who are using primary data source. It could be a mix of both data, data sources. You could use secondary data sources, uh, for example, sensors, NFHS, annual health service are very rich uh, sources of secondary data which can be used beautifully to answer some of the research questions. So don't think that secondary is kind of a second in the list of uh, uh, data uh, sources and kind of it, it gives less validation to your research. And in the on the other hand, you can also do primary data which is collected by the researcher. Many times it is not possible for us to collect the entire data and we have to depend on secondary data sources. But many times the need of the research question is that if we are just relying on the secondary data sources and not providing enough field information, primary uh, data is collected collected from the field work. If you're not giving enough field information, then we might think that we are not doing justice to our research question. Now, when we are using primary data, the research design will be surveys. We have to conduct surveys. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of surveys that we can conduct. Now, when I'm talking about type of surveys, you know, surveys could either be questionnaire. What is a questionnaire? Questionnaire is a pen and paper kind of a survey. And questionnaire is just not one type of questionnaire. There are, very, and there are various types of it that I'm going to talk about. And the second type of survey is interview. You know, interview is when you talk, just talking to a person is not an interview. When you talk with a purpose, when you are kind of engaging into a purposeful conversation. Now, coming to questionnaire types, you know, it could be a mail survey. 
what we do in a mail survey, you have a questionnaire, you send it by postal mail to your participants and you know, you either pay the postage or you tell them that it has to be uh, kind of sent back to you within a certain period of time and this type of uh, mail survey is uh, generally conducted in many of the developed countries uh, for example uh, the census of canada you know here you have a census enumerator who comes to uh, every household and collects the census data but in canada it is a mail survey they send the uh, census questionnaire by mail and the and the postage is paid and of course you have to uh, kind of fill out the survey and send it back so it could be a mail survey it could be a group administered questionnaire so what we do in a group administered questionnaire is that we have a group of research participants or a sample whatever you want you might want to call them and we distribute the questionnaire to them you do not fill out the questionnaire the participants fills out the questionnaire, but the researcher or the research assistant is there to help them understand if they have difficulty to comprehend some of the questions. Okay, but there is a technical difference between a group administered, administered questionnaire and a focus group discussion. What happens in a focus group discussion? which is a qualitative uh, method, what we do is that the researcher is there and she or he kind of leads the conversation and, you know, allows the participants to engage into discussions on certain type of topics and the notes are taken by the researcher himself or herself. But in a group administered questionnaire, the researcher, the role of the researcher is just an observer or if there is any clarification, they kind of provide it. It's more like an investigation, investigator uh, in an examination, invigilator in an examination. So you can also do group administered questionnaire. The third is a household drop off. So what happens in a household drop off? You go to each household and you give the questionnaire and you tell them that I'll come on certain date and certain time to pick up the questionnaire. So again, it is, you know, done by the uh, participants. And here, instead of sending it by mail, you go and you uh, kind of uh, bring it back. And the difference between a mail survey and a household drop off is that the chances the, of the response rates in household drop off might be higher because when they see you in person, they might think, okay, and I'll fill it up. But think about the innumerable mails that you get and you think, oh, I have to kind of fill it up and send it. You might just cross the day also, the date for posting the questionnaire. So that there's a kind of tactical difference and advantage and disadvantage in this type of questionnaire. The fourth type of questionnaire, which is very much uh, in use these days, is the online survey. You know, you have the Survey Monkey, you have Google Doc, you have so many other uh, kind of formats. So what you do, you, you kind of have an online questionnaire, which is sent by email or by WhatsApp group to your respondent and they are expected to fill out the questionnaire and send it back to you. Again, this online survey questionnaire, uh, you need to have a specific type of group for a kind of addressing this type of question. They need to have uh, access to internet, right? To fill out the question, they might be literate. So these are some of the considerations that we have to uh, take into account for deciding what type of questionnaire to uh, adopt for the uh, study. The next is the interview. Interview, you know, we could have the personal interview, which is the most common form of interview that we are accustomed to, where you kind of interview the person, uh, the participant in person. Then we have telephone interview. You know, telephone interview, they might also call you over telephone. The customer care services, always they make an effort to call you over telephone and they ask you an N number of questions, right? So that could be a telephone interview, could conduct the uh, interview over telephone. And the next one is a kind of a web chat. So what happens in a web chat is that, you know, you can, uh, you could uh, kind of uh, log into your uh, web account and you can invite the person to have an online interview, which is kind of an online interview. 
Now, having a kind of designated the different types of questionnaires and the interview methods, what I would like to draw your attention towards, and this is very important, and many times we forego things. We just, you know, decide. We said, this is what I'm going to do. But as I said, there has to be proper rational behind a decision. And therefore, it is very important to take into consideration certain uh, factors before selecting the research method. So the first issues that we need to consider while selecting the research method is population issues. First and foremost in the population, can the population be enumerated? If you're talking about homeless people, people who are living on the streets, can you enumerate them for them? Can you send out a mail drop of questionnaire or a group administered questionnaire? No. So you have to consider whether the population can be enumerated. Is the population literate? If the population is not literate, interview is the best way of conducting uh, your research. And in interview also, you cannot have a web chat because if they are not literate, they will not be able to chat with you. Secondly, are there language issues? You know, the lang if you are going to say, for example, do your research on some of the tribes, do you know the language of the tribe or can they understand your language? Not necessarily you always have to know it, even they have to understand what you are saying. So language issue you have to take into consideration. In that case, you might not be considering to do a, um, a kind of a questionnaire rather an interview might be accepted with the help of an interpreter. Then will the population cooperate with you? You know, for example, if you're talking about you know, juvenile crime or some of the things that has a social stigma, people who are suffering from TB, are they willing to cooperate with you? Nobody wants to tell that they have a problem. So you have to consider in this case, this is very sensitive. What type of research method will be most applicable? Then, of course, what are the geographic restrictions? You know, as a supervisor, as being a faculty, we have seen the students come up with the samples. I saying my sample will be from all over India. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You cannot do that. It's good to be optimistic, but don't overestimate yourself. You cannot go around the whole of India and collect, you know, 200 samples. So you have to understand the geographical restrictions. And if you want to do that, what is the method? Can you do a personal interview in that case? No, perhaps you have to resort to online questionnaire or you have to do a web chat or a telephone interview. So all these are the populations issues that we have to consider. The second is the sampling issue that is very important. What data is available? If you want to do a mail drop of a survey or if you want to do a telephone uh, uh, interview, do you have an updated telephone directory? Do you have the whereabouts of all the people that you want to uh, consider as your study, study participant? So what data is available is very, info, very important. Can respondents be found? You know, these days we are talking about COVID-19 migrant laborers. Where will they be found? Will they be found in the quarantine centers? Will they be found in the villages? Will they be found uh, somewhere in the highways where these poor people are trying to make their ways uh, to their home from the place of destination? So can respondents be found? Thirdly, who is the respondent? That is very important. Many times what happens we in, when we try to make a questionnaire, we say that who is we have in mind whom we want to fill out the questionnaire by. Do we want the head of the household to fill up the questionnaire? So if you want the head of the household to fill up the questionnaire, and you send a, a mail drop or a house drop of questionnaire and it is filled out by the uh, say uh, the child of the house, then is it serving your purpose? No. So you have to be very specific about who you want the respondent to be. Most of the time, you know, when we go into the field talking about maternal health, we try to interview the pregnant women or the, the you know, the new mothers. But most of the time, the questions are answered by the mother-in-laws. But our purpose, the respondent is not a mother-in-law. So in that case, we are getting a wrong response. Right? because we are not specific about who the respondent is. Then can all members of the population be sampled? 
can you consider each and every one given all the population issues that we have talked about then our response rates likely to be a problem as i said in house drop of questionnaire uh, there's a lot of problem with uh, response rate. same with online questionnaire also but you know these days almost every week we receive a tons of questionnaire do we fill out all the questionnaires and send it so if you have a sample size of 100 in mind and you send out 100 questionnaire but you only get 25 filled in questionnaire then what happens response rates become a problem and we have a sampling error the third issue that we need to consider is the question issue that is what type of questions can be asked we just cannot go and ask anything and everything you know they are not uh, actually they are doing you a favor by answering to your questions you are not doing them a favor by asking them so you have to be very cautious, very sensible about the type of questions that we are going to ask. How complex the questions will be. If you have a very complex question, you cannot have a questionnaire, you know, because the uh, respondent might not even understand your question. In that case, you might have a group administered questionnaire or you might have a personal interview because even over telephone, if you try to explain a lot of you know complexities of the question and many times these days we have got so used to multitasking people might be on the phone and they might be doing something else so what happens is that if it is a very complex and long question they might not be willing to answer you so you have to find out how complex the question is will screening questions be needed what is screening question you know at times you have what is what uh, have you been uh, have you gone for testing for covid 19 yes or no if yes jump to the next question was your result negative or positive so the first question did you go for testing is a screening question because only if depending on that answer we decide whether to go to the next question or not so if we have a lot of screening questions it is better to have an interview rather than a questionnaire because it becomes very difficult for the respondent to follow even people who are literate and educated find uh, difficulty in uh, filling up questionnaires which has a lot of screening screening questions in it then can question sequence be controlled? That is, you have prepared the questionnaire, but what do you wanted to ask in the second section of the questionnaire? Can it be asked at the end? You know, and if it can be controlled, then it is again better to have an interview rather than a uh, questionnaire. Then will lengthy questions be asked? You don't expect them to write an essay. They don't have time. Okay, so you have to also be judgmental about the length of the questions. And also many times, you know, we try to kind of put it on scale. How satisfied are you? Or, you know, how, uh, what was your lockdown experience? It was very satisfying. It was very boring. It was very relieving. So you have a very scale. So usually if you have scale more than five, then people find it very difficult to kind of put their responses. So we, if you have response skills and if you want to use it, try to make it short and simple. The next issue is the content issue. That is, can the respondents be expected to know about the issue? Whom you are asking, for example, if you want to understand the experience of tsunami, and if you're asking some people who are in uh, Bihar or in UP, can they be expected to know in detail about that? Or if you want to know about the, uh, you know, the migration um, pattern, and if you're uh, going to a place where there's very less migrants, are they expected to know about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the difficulties of, of these people face? So, it has to be uh, channelized. The next is will respondent need to consult record if you are wanting to know what was the livestock production or what was the crop production over the last couple of years to assess the um, economic condition of a village of a community then do they need to go back and consult record and this also happens on not only um, in uh, the type of examples I gave but a lot of time in health uh, studies when we do many times people need to consult their records we ask them what was the last time you visited a doctor what was the health problem that you came up with so if they need to do this type of consultations of um, records then you have to decide what type of survey method you want to choose 
The next is the bias issue. You know, all of our human beings and none of us are free of bias. We have different types of bias in that us. And that also kind of goes into the selection of our method. So in the bias issue, we can say, can social desirability be avoided? caste bias class bias don't try to impose you know if coming from an upper caste you try to um, uh, do research on the lower caste people or you want to from a marginalized background if you want to do on the mainstream people you know bias could be either ways it could be a marginalized bias it could be a mainstream bias so can these things be avoided can interviewer distortion and subversion be controlled can we say that, oh, whenever we are trying to talk about a tribe, they are exotic, they are culture. No, no, no. This is your own perspective. Are we in a position to control this type of distortion and subversion by the researcher? Then thirdly, can false respondents be avoided? False respondents, for example, you want, uh, you know, a certain, you want to interview certain CEOs of certain companies you go to the office they say you leave the questionnaire we'll fill it out and we will send it to you so probably the questionnaire is intended to be filled in by the ceo but perhaps a staff in his office fills out the questionnaire so when you get the questionnaire it is actually a false respondent right so in such case perhaps you would want to do an interview then administrative issues are always their cost how much money you have to conduct the research you know do you have enough grant uh, do you have other financial supporting uh, to do the type of uh, survey or technique that you want to adopt what are the facilities if you want to do an online survey or a web chat do you have proper internet connection do you have the softwares needed do you have subscription to the various you know online platforms that are used for it time time is very important if you're doing a PhD, you cannot do it for life. Even if you are a faculty, we are doing a research, we cannot do it for eternity. There's a time span within which we have to complete the assigned task. So that has to be taken into account personal. How many people are can you can be employed or engaged in doing the research? You know, you, you cannot uh, kind of do a heartland task. We have to be very realistic in that. And the last and the very important issue that many of us do not consider in research but you know these days it has it is becoming very um, kind of viable and in the developed countries it is kind of a necessity before you do a research are the ethical issues first consent do you have consent of the people of whom you are doing your research on it could be a written consent if your population is literate. It could be a verbal consent if your population is illiterate. These days you will see, you might have seen your WhatsApp and media being flooded with, you know, showing people who are in need and there are, you know, good Samaritans who are going to help them. They're clicking pictures and, you know, trying to draw narratives. But do you have the consent of these people to use their pictures in your research? did they allow you to do that if not it is unethical so we need the consent of our research participants confidentiality in research is very important you know when people give you give out certain information you have to maintain confidentiality you have to we always write in our research uh, chapters in our publications that all the names are pseudonyms anonymity is maintained you know because many times they come out with various uh, um, sensitive information so they don't like to give out their name so we have to build this trust of confidentiality and the third i call them the three c's of ethical issues is compensation if you are talking to them they are taking out their time either to fill out the questionnaire or to kind of uh, give you um, you know an interview you need to compensate for the time and the effort. You could either give them a token of appreciation, you could give them honorarium, depending on whatever your budget or, you know, uh, it is ethical. You cannot give them, you shower them with expensive gifts. Then again, that will lead to false respondents and your sample might be a kind of not a very normal sample. So these are some of the issues that a researcher has to consider and have to be very careful about before choosing their research method. Now, 
as I said, I'm not going to go into the typical uh, context of qualitative methods, quantitative methods, statistical techniques. I think that, you know, when we have come up to this stage, all of us are kind of accustomed to with this type of methods to certain extent or the other. But what I would like to point out is that as uh, you know, there is no right or wrong method, as I already said, and not necessarily that we just have to take one method into consideration. We can have a blend of various methods depending on a research question. So, you know, in geography, as geography has evolved from a scientific background, so there was a lot of quantification in geography, a lot of numbers were there. But but those of us who do uh, you know, hardcore statistics, we know how to lie with statistics, right? We know that how even numbers can lead to some um, wrong interpretation and results. So geographers were kind of, and with the influence of other social sciences like anthropology, sociology, uh, we uh, have developed into a different more nuanced branches within a geography when we have health geography, medical geography, you know, population geography. So it was, it became necessary not only to put numbers but also to go beyond the numbers and see that what goes into making of these numbers and as geographers we also started to uh, delve into qualitative techniques interviews focus groups discussions all these things but many times a research question decides that we might need both the use of quantitative as well as qualitative methods and this is very contemporary in geography in like in most of the social sciences and it is called the mixed method approach it kind of counterbalances because if you are just a qualitative they say how is it what is scientific about it and if you have all numbers then they said like you know what is the subjectivity of the researchers so we have a mixed method is a research approach whereby researchers collect and analyze both qualitative and quantitative data within the same study. So your study is the same, but you use both quantitative as well as qualitative data. So what does it require? It requires a purposeful mixing of methods in data collection, data analysis, and interpretation of the evidence. Many times we do a survey, you know, we have the quantitative uh, data, then after analyzing, after doing all the sophisticated quantitative techniques like um, logistic regression and coefficient, Pearson's, everything, we try to find out what are some of the basic themes on which we need to delve into more in-depth analysis and we conduct qualitative um, method on that. So it needs a very purposeful mixing. Just don't do it for the sake of doing it. You have to justify what you do. So this purposeful data integration enables researcher to gain a holistic view of the issue study. You can say that I'm not only looking from a quantitative aspect or a qualitative aspect, rather I'm having a qualitative uh, um, very kind of holistic understanding. And this is kind of one of the in things these days. Then another method that I wanted to talk about is the digital method. You know, digital method, let me remind you, is not like filling out an online questionnaire or doing a web chat, but rather it is the techniques for the study of societal and cultural change with online data. So here we are using internet as a source of data, okay? Not as a kind of a way of generating um, the data, but it itself is a huge source of data because it involves use of online and digital technologies to collect and analyze research data. And I give you some example, they make use of digital objects such as hyperlinks, tags, like, share, retweets for the study of web data. So on the web, you have a lot of data. You have various websites. You have your social networking sites, Facebook, Twitter. So you see how many times, you know, you posted a picture, how many people liked it, how many shared it, you know, how many people tagged you, what are the hyperlinks. So these are the data. And in this age, you know, digital method uh, is gaining in popularity and more so because of the social distancing and, you know, our uh, prohibited um, or I would, say, I would say restricted kind of mobility digital method have become very important. 
now having talk of this now i will come to a kind of to, um, uh, to what i call the data analysis now, as i said i'm not going to talk about the conventional type of data analysis uh, of statistical techniques or qualitative coding and uncoding and writing narratives but today i want to expose you to some of the newer uh, uh, type of data analysis that can be done and also as geographers which we could readily do one such analysis is the visual analysis so in visual analysis what we do is that we research visual method materials for example it could be movies it could be advertisements it could be newspaper cuttings so according to ross production of empirically grounded response to particular visual materials is known as visual methodologies and it is very important to justify your interpretation when you are doing a visual analysis it is very just very important to justify why you are interpreting it the way you are doing it and i'll just give you an example so to do this we need to have an explicit explicit methodology you know what are you considering in uh, the visual material that you are taking for your research now as i said i'll give you an example for example this is an advertisement from newspaper of call center job so you see you have like two people here and you have the call center advertisement and they are ad advertising of how great the jobs are so if you want to do research based on advertisements and this is just an example as i said and here are two more advertisements of the call center jobs one is from the same company the other one is from a different company so based on this advertisements um, we wanted to understand that what type of uh, you know uh, the, this advertisements try to project an image of a call center worker that what you would be like to work in a call center so how will this advertisements allow us to analyze the image of a call center and as i said it goes into various uh, it is a very nuanced type of analysis that you have to do depending on the type of pictures used the colors the fonts uh, in the advertisement that are used and based on all this you know we came out to the conclusion and we had analyzed like uh, 1347 uh, around 1400 advertisements to reach to this slide what i'm showing you that creating image of the call center agent based on this advertisement it shows that the call center agent needs to be an urban youth who is intelligent outgoing fashionable fun loving and ready to be part of the global youth culture so this is also a type of analysis that you could do but as I said, when it comes to analysis, you need not restrict yourself. Be imaginative and, you know, play on your strength. So the other types of qualitative data analysis that you could do as a researcher, you could write a poetry, you know, a poetic inquiry based on the analysis of your data. Your data could be presented in form of a poet. So if you have a poet within you and you never got a chance, given the type of coursework and all the researches that you have to do, here is the time. Write your analysis in terms of a poet. If you're an artist, make a collage, you know, to interpret or to analyze your data. These are visual forms. Write a narrative inquiry. It could be in form of a script. It could be in form of, a, you know, a story. And you could um, also do, you know, phenomenological inquiry. That is, you have a phenomena, then you kind of subdivide it into various themes, and you can come out with different types of results. So these are various types of innovative uh, type of ways in which your data can be analyzed for better. Uh, uh, better dissemination you know that is what is the next thing i'm going to come to now once we have done our wonderful research it is time for us to disseminate our research and this is again a very critical thing you know and the base part of research dissemination there are various aspects to you it, you could do a conference presentation but the most accepted form of academic research dissemination is through publication either you publish or you perish there is no midway right but to publish there are certain things that we have to take into consideration because we often think that whatever we have written is a masterpiece and if the person is rejecting it he or she is not in that intellectual capacity to understand the type of research output that we have had but trust me it is not so when we sit on the editorial board of various reputed journals there are certain criteria that 
that are laid down and they're very easy and simple and they are very much doable. And based on that, I'm just going to share a few slides with you about research dissemination. So when we talk about essentials of writing a research paper, I know it is very mind blogging. So basically we have to first know what is a research paper. It is not your opinion piece. It is not what you think you just write. It has certain structures, uh, certain outlines to it. So it is the culmination of final product of an involved process of research, critical thinking, source evaluation from where you have taken the sources no wikipedia please organization how well you have organized your research and of course composition so these are the various components of a research paper and when we come to the steps of writing research paper i often tell it to our research uh, uh, scholars i think some of them are online also today so i said you choose a topic first and foremost choose a topic identify an audience you know you have to know for whom you are writing are you writing it for the government is it an evaluation paper is it us are you writing for a research scholars are you writing it uh, for an interdisciplinary audience so you have to identify who you are writing it for then of course you have to do research you have to provide an outline a draft and then revising, editing, and proofreading. And trust me, I wish there was, but there is no template or shortcut for writing a research paper. You have to go through these steps. And the process, you know, 15% of it is worrying. You just think, you worry what to write about it. Then 10% is you plan how to do your research, how to write it, how to do the um, you know, outlining. And 25% is actually writing. But what is more important is revising. So when your supervisor or your colleague or your seniors gives you feedback you know, to revise, don't take it as a setback because most of the things that we write, 45% comes from revision. Many times we are so saturated with our own work that we, we kind of tend to overlook many things. You know, We think there is a link and people can follow it. No, it is very important to, for others to understand what you are writing. Okay, and of course, 5% is proofreading. You have to do all the editorial and the grammatical uh, changes that need to be done to make it readable and publishable. So this is a kind of a broad structure of a research paper, but necessarily need not be constrained to this because many journals have their own format. They have their own uh, kind of, you know, structure. So basically we come up with the title. The title should not be more than 20 words. You know, the title should not be as long as your abstract. Abstract should not be one page. It should be somewhere between 150 to 300 words. Most of the, um, you know, uh, reputed uh, um, uh, conferences these days, uh, they say that your abstract has to be just 100 words. You cannot cross 100 words. Keywords, you have to be very uh, selective about keywords. One of the keywords has to be about your research, one has to be about the method you have used. One has to be about the geographical location where your research is placed. And the fourth one, which you think is one of the most important finding of the research. And the fifth one, depending on whatever you think is very important in that the audience needs to know from the keywords. Then we have introduction, method, results, finding, discussion, conclusion, acknowledgement. You should always acknowledge not only enough you know the funding agencies are very rude they just tell you that if you publish based on this um uh, on this project you have to acknowledge the funding agencies not only the funding agencies you should acknowledge your research participants without whom you would not have been able to get the data or do the analysis based on which you have written your research paper and of course references please if your paper is two pages long your references cannot be four pages just put the references that you have used in the text, not everything and ev anything that you have ever seen and never read. Because as a reviewer, as an editor, we are able to make out that what references has been actually referred to and what references are just to increase the list. And then editing is the most important part of writing any research paper. 
So when we talk about editing, 90% of writing is editing. You have to edit. Now, how do you edit? It also has certain guidelines. First, delete every unnecessary word, you know. Use the synonym uh, option that is given in the Microsoft Word. Have a list of words. Don't repeat the words and don't use flowery languages, you know, because you are actually trying to convey a research finding and research output. So delete every word that is unnecessary. Break down complex sentences. Don't write a sentence which is as long as a paragraph. Write short sentences. If you write short sentences, there is less chance of making mistakes. And especially since none of our, uh, you know, our native English speakers. So what happens? We have a lot of grammatical error, and the grammatical error gives so, keeps on increasingly proportionately. If you do a kind of correlation between the uh, number of grammatical errors and the length of the sentence, you will see that they are strongly positively correlated. So you have to write short sentences, and you have to write, uh, you know, grammatically error-free. Try to write grammatically error-free sentences. Then convert passive into active voice. You know, don't, it is always, a, you, when you read any uh, research paper, when you read uh, some pieces, you will see that it is always better that if you read in the active voice, you feel that the researcher is kind of uh, uh, conveying it um, on a different note. So these are some of the things that I wanted to convey to you about uh, research methodology and doing research. And as I said, there is no right or wrong uh, research method. It depends on what you choose and how you choose what is your destination. Now with that, I would like to conclude and I just like to say that stay safe, stay at home and it gives you more time to think through your research. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such a nice presentation. Uh, we have some questions uh, from our participants. Uh, this is, there is one question from Riyanka Shah. Uh, question is, how GIS technique be useful for dealing with health-related problems, especially the mental health? Shall I repeat it? Yes, can you please repeat it? Yeah. Uh, question is, how GIS technique be useful for dealing with health related problems, especially the mental health? Okay, so as I said, like, um, uh, I'm not a GIS expert, so you'll have other sessions on GIS, but of course, do I do GIS as a geographer. And to answer your question, I would uh, say uh, that, you know, when we uh, do health geography, uh, it does not actually uh, these days lay a lot on the mental health part that we leave to the uh, psychologist to, to deal into it. And as a geographer, when we are do dealing with GIS, our most uh, important concern is spatial uh, kind of uh, mapping. You know, we want to show that how spatially it is kind of uh, segregated or congregated over a place of time. So again, depending, mental health is a very broad term. What exactly in mental health you want to understand? As is, you have to be very specific. You know, that is, and that is the mistake we always make as a researcher. We kind of come up with very broad uh, things, very broad broad uh, broader concepts and we try to uh, kind of uh, fit it so there is no kind of one thing fits all you have to understand what exactly in mental health you want to deal with what problem you want to deal with you know and how you want to show a spatial distribution of this problem over a period of time over a period of region and uh, then you have to and accordingly you have to choose the techniques thank you ma'am uh, there is one more question from Dipali. Uh, it is, how do we balance the qualitative and quantitative part in mixed approach? Yes, it's a very relevant question, uh, Dipali, that you asked that how do we balance? As I said, you know, it depends on your research question. 
how much part of your research question requires that you give a quantitative tinge to it. You know, if you are dealing with, uh, say, uh, the development aspects of a community, some of the things might be explained very well in terms of quantitative measures. For example, literacy rate, uh, the health status, infant mortality rate, all these things, you know. But on the other hand, if you want to look at some of the nuanced issues of development, that is on the day-to-day -day activities, livelihoods, perhaps you have to, uh, perhaps a qualitative approach would be more, more uh, kind of viable. So the balance you have to decide as a researcher it is you no third person can decide the balance for you you know if the third person does decide then the research that with which intensity or which uh, what uh, kind of uh, future nomination you saw the research to be the beauty of the research ceases because it is your brainchild you have come up with this research so you are the best judge you are the person who is in the best position to decide that how much of quantitative and how much of qualitative is required. There is no 50-50 proportionate. There is no kind of cookbook recipe for it. It has to be decided by the researcher depending on their research question. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for addressing these questions. And thank you for your elaborate presentation on criteria for choosing research study design, data collection, and types of research methods. I'm sure this will be of great help to all the geographers, the faculty members, and upcoming researchers. Please accept our sincere gratitude once more. Thank you. And Thank uh, now, so we have come to the end of the first day of this uh, national webinar. Tomorrow our session will begin at 11 p.m. Sorry, 11 a.m. Have a good day.